CPUs, <laughs> CPUs, and Pentiums, and Socket 7, <laughs> it's K6, it's, yeah, <laughs> Hey, hey, high treason, wake up you cunt, yeah you've got to make a video, come on, you're running late, come on, got to do it now. Do I look impressed to you? Hello everybody, I'm High Treason. And yeah, CPUs. Too many bloody CPUs. I'm sick of the fucking things. Now, I still like them. But uh, I was working on a video called Socket 7 Showdown. I had multiple attempts at it and it kept going wrong. Benchmarks not running, blue screens of death. Getting electrocuted, you fucking name it, it probably went wrong. Although nothing set fire, as far as I remember. Although I might have been passed out from electrocutions by that time. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so what I'm going to do is, uh, this one's put together quite quickly. We're going to have a look at three years, six hours building for the purpose of my guide videos. I do work on those, you know. I've, I've not forgotten them. It's just a very big project, and I want to finish all of them before I start uploading them. In fact, we might have to dismantle the whole machine again for the purpose of those videos, given that when it started, it was filmed on a different camcorder and the quality and location isn't really consistent now. That aside, yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, 386 time. Overviews like this are going to be in HD widescreen from now on, whereas if we're looking at software that isn't widescreen, then we're going to stay in lower resolutions at 4.3 because it's more appropriate for different types of monitor and obviously the software's native resolution looks horrible if you stretch things. Uh, let's get on with this. We won't be delving very far into the software side of things today. The machine lives in this case and it's missing a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive right now. The, as this one does work with CD drives I'm not sure I'll ever really bother rectifying this. It's an ATX case but I used a backplate to adapt it that I had to file the hull a bit bigger on one side, as this case doesn't usually take normal plates. I hate it when they do that shit. Inside is a shuttle HOT-307H motherboard. It's a late 386 motherboard, and it doesn't really have any special features. It only supports 33 and 40 MHz CPUs as well. Some variants of this board came with an embedded CPU, the mine came with an AMD 386DX40 in a lift socket, so a 40 MHz CPU, and I will show you the lift socket in a minute. At the moment a Cyrix is installed, and you might notice the numbering on that, which is pretty interesting, 486DLC. Great, so I'll have to buy the 4 separately to the 86 online. I plan on keeping this chip in here after I finish doing this video. There's also an IIT 4C87 DLC40. Bloody DLC, man. The 386 was the first x86 CPU to have 32-bit instructions, though Intel had poor yields early on, and some processors could only run 16-bit software without locking up. The 32-bit capability is why some 32-bit applications and drivers, especially in the Windows operating system, are marked as i386 or have the file extension of 386, implying their 32-bit applications, drivers or libraries. 8 1MB 30-pin SIMs are installed. Wait, SIMs? Oh. 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 I have used the Seng ET4000 from the 486 in here, and I've given the 486 the Trident that came with this board. The ET4000 is one of the faster chips for ISA cards, 
Plus, the 486 gives off the same vibe as a middle-aged hooker, so the slots are loose and it'll go with anything. Because the bias doesn't clear the screen on the 386, I know the card was called a Quickworks 24i capture board, but I still can't find information about it, and I want to know what features it's hiding. I seriously want to know. There's a generic Hearst adapter card above this. This one's a little bit odd because it doesn't seem to have the joy port that quite a lot of them did have. Though I would have only disabled it, so it saved me a task. There's nothing smart about it except the CD-ROM support, although that might be down to the bias on the motherboard more than the card, as the card doesn't really do an awful lot. As far as CD-ROM supports go, I'm using this quad speed Mitsumi, though I might replace it with a Sony I have that's a bit older. The hard drive is a 1GB Quantum Fireball, it's IDE. Uh, DOS 6.22 is only detecting 512MB for some reason, despite the BIOS being able to see the whole drive, even in its own utilities. I might get replaced with a CF card at some point. This machine still isn't really finished yet. A Sound Blaster 1.5 is installed here, no CMS chips, I won't buy them. SAA 1099s will do, as those are all CMS chips would be anyway, and Creative only made one chip on this card, and even then I'm pretty certain it was based on a controller designed by Intel, so the Sound Blaster isn't the most original piece of hardware in there. At least not as far as design and innovation goes. There's 256 kilobytes of L2 cache installed, the board's supposed to support it, but it won't boot if I set it up, and I've heard bad things about using that amount on 386s anyway, like performance hits and loss of floppy drive functionality, and I don't really want that. This machine's quiet. But that's rather hard to hear in this room, with two wax stations, a large Ethernet switch and various other pieces of equipment roaring loudly. Though I suppose that does prove my point. The bias is by American Megatrends. It's good, though the warnings can be a little irritating. However, I don't really have to go in here enough that they're going to bother me too much. I haven't seen these appear on every variant of this bias, so it's hit and miss as to whether you'll get those on a board from this time. It offers automatic hard drive detection, and otherwise there's enough things to play with that you'd probably never actually have to play with, besides hidden refresh which I need for what I'm doing here. There's a weird bug making the clock run strangely. It does pass the synchronicity test in PC check, and I'm not too worried about it. Maybe I've finally found a board that isn't Y2K compliant, but I seriously doubt it. Does anyone remember that? Bullshit. Seriously. Millennium bug. Fucking garbage. I might just set it to 1993 and pretend to be there anyway, I suppose. I mean, lots of awesome things happened that year. Mr. Vane, I played my first video game, Duke Nukem 2 came out, as well as Doom. Pentiums were launched, Countdown to Extinction came out, and I could go on and on. I switched to the AM386 before starting up. The lift socket works like this. There's no lever, and you have to pry the CPU out of it slowly and carefully. The new one simply just pushes in, providing the pins are straight. The FPU would be the same deal, and back then FPUs were costly and not many programs made use of them. Floating point math is generally math that uses decimal points. This is handled by the floating point unit, the FPU. Integer math is math that generally doesn't have a floating point, in fact, as a rule it will not have a floating point, and is handled by the Central Processing Unit, or CPU, or to be more specific, the ALU, or Arithmetic Logic Unit, within the CPU. The, the only people that needed an FPU were generally users of CAD, or possibly large spreadsheets and databases that may have handled currency or some such data, otherwise just programs that were mathematically intense and you would only have bought one if you really needed it. Most games prior to Quake had no use for such a device, though by that time the FPU came on board the CPU anyway, so it didn't matter. I'm using DOS 6.22, and I'll start Navratil Software System Information, or NSSI, where you can see the specifications for this machine, although I've already told you those. Uh, so, yeah, let's benchmark the processor and co-processor. 
Well, as far as I'm aware, the CPU got 11,095 dry sterns, and the FPU got 23,048 kilo wet sterns. That is a benchmark that was devised in the United Kingdom, so it's awesome. I'll summarise these again later. I'll remember them so you don't have... Well, you, you get the picture. Switching to the i3-860X33 identifies as an AMD to this program, and this might be bias related, but I assure you it is using the Intel chip right now. That aside, we get 9369 dry sterns for the CPU and 2027 kilo wet sterns for the FPU. Actually, do remember the FPU here, it's dropped a little, but clocking it down would probably cause this, right? At least that's what we'd expect. We've lost about 300 points. Feeling a little stupid, I'm going to run the Intel at 40 MHz. Overclocking's not a practical solution in my opinion, just try overclocking a server or a rack station, and you'll be laughed out of your workplace very, very quickly. Keep in mind this CPU's now running at 121% of its rated speed without really complaining about it, and no voltage increases. Try doing that on a modern processor. This shows that there isn't much difference between the Intel AMD solution, though the Intel runs colder at either clock speed. Both run cold anyway though, so that's kind of negligible I guess. The results are 11,095 dry stones for the CPU and 2,348 kilo wet stones for the FPU, which sounds awfully familiar to me. The Cyrix is back, and I think it's time I come clean. What Cyrix essentially did was wire a 486 to the bus of a 386. None of the other CPUs have internal cache, though this one handles the external differently, and that is disabled by default, and for the following tests. IBM used one on an expansion card for a 286. They built, but like most IBM parts, the machine sucked ass with or without the card. So is a CPU any good in a proper PC? as in a proper clone of a PC, or proper PC compatible. It runs quite hot, but maybe there's a good reason for that. Well, at 33 MHz, with L2 cache turned off, the Intel and AMD had L2 cache enabled. The scores are 13,265 dry stones for the CPU, and 4,802 kilo wet stones for the FPU. The FPU performance more than doubles here, despite the clock being the same as the i386DX. How is this happening? Well, I'm not entirely sure. It's quite possible that the L1 cache, which is 1 kilobyte, on this CPU is used to some advantage, as opposed to the other CPU having to use the much slower SIM RAM, given that all instructions are more than likely passed to the CPU before being offloaded to the FPU for this test. Another likelihood is that the IIT 4C87 DLC, being a hybrid design for both 386 and 486 class processors, is somehow enhanced when running with a 486 class CPU, as in it may have two modes of operation, or there is a faster communication between it and the processor. It's kind of sad now in the company that made this thing a voice over IP provider these days. Well, want to try it at 40 MHz? I want to move fast with this as it gets very hot very quickly at this speed. There's actually a 40 MHz version of the chip, and I think the IBM used a 50 MHz. Texas Instruments made a version with more cache. IBM TI and ST labeled chips were generally rebadges of Cyrix CPUs as those companies made Cyrix's designs. The test gives us 15,524 dry stones for the CPU and 5178 kilo wet stones for the FPU, which seems about right for the clock speed. There's one last test, back at 33 MHz with the L2 cache enabled. This will yield 14,314 dry stones for the CPU, and 4,886 kilo wet stones for the FPU. I am genuinely impressed. Let's recap, shall we? I'll display this on screen as well, so you don't just have to remember what my voice is saying. The AM3860X at 40 MHz got 11,095 dry stones and 2,348 kilo wet stones. The i3860X at 33 MHz 
got 9,369 dry sterns, 2,027 kilo wet sterns. At 40 MHz, the i3860X got 11,095 dry sterns and 2,348 kilo wet sterns. The Cyrix 4860LC at 33 MHz with L2 cache disabled got 13,265 dry sterns and 4,802 kilo wet sterns. The Cyrix 4860LC at 40 MHz got 15,524 dry sterns and 5,178 kilo wet sterns. The same CPU at 33 MHz with the L2 cache enabled via the hidden refresh feature in the BIOS achieves 14,314 dry sterns and 1,886 kilo wet sterns. I think we've got a clear winner, although this test ignores the release dates for the processors. The Intel came out around two years earlier than the AMD processor, the former in 1989 and the latter in 1991, although this might be down to Intel taking AMD to court, as I believe their chip was finished sooner. I wonder why they let UMC get away with the U5S, given that this was why it says it couldn't be sold in the USA. In the AMD's defence, the score was absolutely identical to the Intel at the same clock rate. So they did a very good job cloning the processor, not to mention that it did sell much cheaper. The Cyrix appeared in 1992 and is not an Intel clone, it isn't Intel compatible. The difference being that a clone is an exact, or very very nearly exact, copy of an existing design, whereas a compatible is an at least mostly new design made to be compatible with an existing set of specifications. I have no idea how much the Cyrix cost, as delving into Usenet archives from 1993 shows prices were between $150 and $550 for the same model, depending on the dealer. So what have we learnt today? Well, I've learned nothing, because I know everything. And you puny humans, no, I'm, I'm just fucking around. I did this because I had absolutely no idea what would happen. And what we have learned is that sticking a 486 into a 386 socket might actually have been a pretty good idea on Cyrix's part. It would certainly have been a viable upgrade option and it would have allowed OEMs to save money in the day in that they'd only have had to make one board for two different classes of computer system. Now all I need is some smart ass to turn up with a DRX2 and pretty much make my machine look slow. However, if you found this interesting, uh, let me know, because I don't have any shortage of CPUs at this moment in time. I've been trying to complete my collection, and I don't really intend to leave them on display kind of thing, like previous owner did. And some of them are actually quite special, though we can't run all of them yet. So I might try doing something like this again. I might even have another go at the Socket 7 Showdown in future. In the meantime, though, I'm high treason, and... <laughs> Hey, hey. Yeah. You know, who was that guy? Oh.